well, there was a lot of truth in that right there. I do 90% of the talking or more in our household, but Laurel does all the thinking. I gotta thank her for a second because I wouldn't have this opportunity to be with you all if it wasn't for her. I told her that YouTube was a terrible idea and it would never work. Every morning she serves me a healthy plate of crow and we go on. So it's, it's this great thing though to be here with you all and this has been a lot of fun already. It's nice to meet a lot of the names that I see on YouTube and Facebook that message me and talk bees with me and now I get to put some faces to the names. That's been a lot of fun. I don't know how this always works out for me when I go speak somewhere. I always end up following somebody like Bob Benny. I just, it, it kills me. <laughs> and then on top of that, I made the mistake of saying, you know, whatever you need me to talk about, I'll do that. You know, just, you just let me know what you need as a conference and then that's fine. I'll, I'll do it. And of course, Bob took all the easy topics on the nice, glorious queen production, honey production, all the fun stuff. I got beetles and moss and stuff like that. And then the other topics on varroa mites. So I feel like the, the kid that went to Bible college with his buddies and he drew the short end of the, the straw and uh, got revelations to speak on, so to speak. All right. That being said, look, there's a lot we can talk about here, and I'm going to kind of focus on what's I feel like is more critical. These are secondary tests, and because I like classic things, I title it Beatles and Moss and More Oh My, because I love uh, The Wizard of Oz and a lot of the stuff from that time period. All right. We hate these things. We get a lot of them in Tennessee, and even the more further south you go, you get a lot of small hive beetle issues. My buddy in Hawaii, it is a just year round and they just build and they build and they build and especially on the island they're a big problem because they also eat fruits and on the island of course there's just wild coconut trees and all kinds of stuff everywhere so there's just beetles all over the place and a good healthy strong colony is the best defense for almost every pest. Really Varroa being the exception to that. They're more resistant long term but Really, when it comes to these lesser pests that we're going to address in this topic, strong, healthy bees is, is the best thing that you can have. Now, for those of you who have ever tried to build a homemade trap for small hive beetles, it is really a big undertaking. They're a small little creature, but you can kind of see in that middle picture, they've got some odd-looking legs. And you can take a sticky trap that will catch a mouse, you can stick a sticky trap that'll catch a roach and all other kinds of bugs, but if you even take these things and push them down into it, they'll still get out. They literally have leg mechanisms that are kind of akin to the tracks on a tank or a half track, and it makes it very easy for them to grind and climb a lot of different things. So, just so you know, if anybody in this room can come up with a small high beetle trap that they will actually stick to, You'll get all the free advertising you want on YouTube, just so you know. I like to see these things dead. Gorgeous, huh? Nasty. And I actually got this from a fellow YouTuber. I didn't even ask permission, but he's a good friend of mine, so if he whines about it, I'll just, eh, whatever. But this, this comes from uh, Randy McCaffrey, the dirt rooster guy out of uh, Mississippi. One of his hives in a video. And... There's just thousands and thousands of small hive beetle larvae in here. And as they hatch from an egg and get in this um, larva stage, they will spread yeast all over your combs, all throughout the colony, and it's very off-putting to the bees. And so if you want to make sure, the number one thing you want to do is have a good, strong colony, but you also want to make sure there's not areas that they can't patrol. The small hive beetles will get into those crevices, especially if it's like a comb on this edge over here, and it's pushed all the way up against that wooden um, wall of that box, and the bees can't patrol it, that's where wax moths and small hive beetles can get in there and really do some damage. And it's really not the beetles themselves that do a ton of damage, it's the larvae here, because that yeast that they secrete is really off-putting to the bees. Now I wanted to say real quick, you can't see these combs really good, 
but I would say that some of the combs in the middle are probably completely ruined. Those would be the ones that have brood in them and bee bread. And that will just because it's so perforated from all of these larvae that it just weakens and just destroys the combs. However, in a situation like this, you may have three or four, and if it's a very light infestation, all of these combs actually may just be slightly damaged. The bees won't like them because of all that yeast, but if you spray them down, hose them down a little bit, as long as the combs are still structurally very strong and not perforated, you can reuse them. And as far as I know, um, there's no, uh, I've never seen any issues with doing that and any problems with disease. But you can, they'll even have a little bit of honey left in them. That yeast will keep the bees from robbing them out. But as soon as you spray it down and get that yeast off of there, bam, they go after the honey that's below it. So there's, there's some variables there. Some people will look at this and say you need to burn the whole thing to the ground. I'm not one of those uh, type of people, but sometimes the cones are ruined, and a lot of times they are if it's an infestation this bad, because they're going for the, their food source is the brood and the bee bread. Just like any other creature, they need those fats, and they need those proteins. Really the wax, just like we call them wax moss. Wax moss aren't really uh, just for the wax, they really want the proteins and the fats, just like everything else. So the best defense, like I said, is a good offense. You need plenty of bees, healthy bees. They need to have good areas of patrol. That really applies to all of these lesser pests that we're going to be talking about. Strong colonies and able to patrol the area. They can cause loss of combs and resources. That's, the, that's their biggest problem. And I'd say the, the most frustrating thing with small hive beetles is if you have honey supers that you're yanking off, if they can get access to any of that bee bread or anything like that, they will lay just all kinds of offspring in there and contaminate your honey. So it's made it a little bit harder for beekeepers that deal with small hive beetles to quickly get those honey supers off and get them extracted very quickly. Also, we have to be a little bit more concerned on how much we store things. The beetles are much more difficult for the bees to manhandle as opposed to the wax moths, which are very soft body. The small hive beetles are very tough. They're, the bees really don't have a way of killing them very easily. Occasionally they will and kind of encase them in a propolis envelope and I don't know if sometimes they stay in there so long that they starve. I know sometimes in the cold of winter if they're kind of kept off to the edge of the hive they can freeze on a really cold day. So there's, a, there's some things that the bees can do but by and large the small hive beetles are extremely good at surviving in honeybee colonies. The main problem with them though is they pressure our wheat colonies when we make splits, when we have mating nukes, maybe we have a colony that has a queen issue, those are prime targets. And just like a lot of insects, they communicate through pheromones, so if there's a colony that's weak or is queenless and they start getting a little bit of a foothold, they encourage more of them to come to that hive. Now over winter, they actually trick our honeybees. They, uh, they communicate with them in a similar way that our other bees do, and it's in the dark of the hive, and they trick the bees into feeding them. Don't you just hate those things? I mean, but they, that's how they're able to survive and overwinter in our honeybee colony. And they go through a similar cycle as our bees, egg, larva, pupa, and then adult. And I tell you the best thing, one thing I almost forgot to mention, is all of these larvae right here. If you have chickens, oh, your chickens will love you forever if you give them those things. And I'm sure it's very healthy for them. My chickens go crazy on that, though I hope to never see this. It does happen from time to time. And they love the beetles. And I think chickens are actually one of the better controls out there as far as biological controls. Um, you can let the chickens run through your home bee yard and they'll scratch around the colonies. And when you see them underneath the hive scratching around, there's a decent chance they're going after the pupae and maybe any larvae that just fell out. But the small hive beetles really don't dig super deep into the soil, especially in areas that have really hard soil. And the, you know, your chicken will really impact the small hive beetle population. It's definitely not a cure-all. When it comes to small hive beetles, there's nothing I don't think any of us can do to eliminate all of them. It's really more of just controlling and keeping our colony strong. Females can lay within a day of emerging from the soil. The larvae, when they, and that's the thing, when you get a hive like this, you need to take evasive action. Feed those to the chickens, get some soapy water, spray them down, or better yet, dump them in a soapy water bucket. Because what we're looking at right here is you're infesting your entire yard, and even maybe yards a little ways away with small hive beetles. 
because those things can turn around in a crazy amount of time. A female can lay within a day of emerging from the soil. As if she gets mated, 24 hours later she's capable of being able to lay eggs, and they're viable. And she will do 165 eggs a day if you know conditions are ideal. It can be over that, it could be less than that, depending on temperature. And I'm sure nutrition plays a, a part in that as well. I definitely noticed in Tennessee that there is a difference in how productive they are in years that are cooler and winters that are harder than when we have a very mild winter and a very warm year. And I think that makes sense to most everybody. They're not as big of a problem up north, but they, they are in the north. And I've heard in some parts of Canada they're there, but I don't know to what extent. So like it says here, two, three days, those eggs will be hatching and then we're going to start seeing this kind of thing a few days later. Initially, they kind of just stay in the cones and start eating what fat and protein sources they can get access to. But once they get at this stage, they really just start pushing the bees on out if there's a lot of them. Now, if there's a handful in the colony, we're talking like five or even 50 of them, and the colony's strong, the bees can deal with it. But uh, this is definitely not sustainable right here. And then again, this, the crazy thing is, is within as little as three weeks and in ideal conditions, even less than three weeks, they can go from like this to doing the whole thing on over again. They can go in two weeks from hitting the ground, going through the pupa stage, emerging, and now they're ready to repeat. So they can really build quickly through summer, especially if you let this many of them go into the soil and cause a lot of problems for your operation later on. And, and for other beekeepers. And like it says, they'll go up to 10 miles. And that's how far they can fly. So if you have a couple bee yards within 10 miles, you may uh, be sending them to the rest of your bees or your neighbor's bees. So um, that's, as beekeepers, we really have to think about other people as well. And I think that kind of comes with the territory. Um, bees impact a lot of things outside of um, their immediate location. They go out of ways and they pollinate and create a lot of seeds and different things for um, plants and also they impact a lot of um, produce for farmers and stuff. But also as beekeepers, we could be sending out varroa mites, we could be sending out small hive beetles, we can be sending out a lot of things to wild honeybees and trees or to our neighbor's bees or whatever. So there's a certain degree of thought that needs to go into all the actions that we take to kind of take care of those around us as well. All right, let's get to the next page. Is that, has that been a fun start to this topic? See what I mean about getting the... The uh, gross and nasty topics. Why can't why can't I got queen rearing? Bob, next time I'm getting queen rearing. All right. So I really don't mind. This is an important topic where I'm at. Again, I talked about how just a little bit isn't too awful big of a problem. This is a strong colony. I'd say at this point we're probably looking at, if I remember correctly, this came off of a video that I did. I believe we were around 14 to 16 frames of bees. Good, strong colony. This is in February. And look at those beetle larvae. That's how tenacious they are. That cluster is warming them up. And of course, the, I threw in, I believe, it was about a two pound patty. And I was making my own patties at that point. And it was, the mistake that I made was throwing a, too big of a piece in. Had I taken that two pound patty and sliced it up into four pieces to where bees could get more surface area, and eat it quicker, I probably would have been fine. Now, did this colony have issues with the small hive beetles? No, they did not. Actually, went on to be a fantastic honey producer. But some people, they throw a patty in, they see this, and oh my goodness, I'll never throw a patty in again. You have to be responsible with them, because if you throw in a pollen patty and the colony's weak, or if you throw too big of a pollen patty for what the colony can handle, then that can be a problem. And I do like using protein supplement, especially coming out of winter. We get our first pollens usually in around the first or second week of February. Um, depending on the year, it could be a little earlier or later. But when that happens, the bees want to. That's the signal, let's start brood rearing queens and everything just start getting off to the races. But then sometimes you get some bad weather. As you all know around here, you get some really poor weather, bees can't fly. And that's where feeding these protein supplements can really come in handy to help smooth out the nutritional gaps, help the bees be able to keep going forward and in some years, you know, 
In a good year, you won't need that, probably. There'll be plenty of flying days, the beach will have plenty of protein, but not all colonies are created equal, and not all flows from year to year are created equal. And so as a professional beekeeper, Laurel and I use these to smooth out the nutritional gaps, and uh, we find them very valuable. But still, when we do this, we'll end up with some of that. That doesn't discourage us from using it, but it does make us think a little bit outside the box, and a lot of what we're doing these days is on a big, strong colony, if we feel like they need two pounds, then we'll slice it up in you know, five different sections or so and just create more surface area. We also are using lids now that have a half-inch rim underneath, underneath the lid, so if it's a single brood box, the, the bees can get up on top and around the edges much better and access that patty. The main thing is the bees consuming it as fast as they can. And then you also just have to learn a lot about your flows because there's certain times of the year where they'll really stop eating these patties they just won't want as much. And so it's just one of those things, just like with anything, you have to pay attention, you have to learn. And if you're not certain, start small. You can always come back and add another patty later. But, you know, if you're not sure, maybe throw something half the size of what you think they need. So let's talk about a little bit of small hive beetle controls here. We really don't have a huge variety of options. There are some other new things, you know, specialized bottom boards, and you can put diatomaceous earth or oil trays in the bottom where the beetles will drop down. But many of them are expensive or late, you know, laborious. So you know, there's, there's other options besides these two, but these are the ones that go in the hive. Over here we have a beetle blaster. There's also the beetle gel. You, you put oil in them or you can put diatomaceous earth which cuts them up. The only thing I don't like about the oil is if you lift the hive and then all that oil goes all, all over the place. And anyone who's used these things know what I'm talking about. Because what do the bees do best? They glue these down. And then, of course, you go to pry them up and they finally give way and there's oil going all over the place. And it's rancid and it gets on your bee suit and guess what you smell like the rest of the year. So I like using diatomaceous earth in them. I think it's more forgiving. We actually did a test two years ago and put a couple of them in there. And I had just as good of control with the oil and the I had just as good control out of the diatomaceous earth as I did the oil. So the diatomaceous earth, I would say somebody here probably has some with them and if you wanted to try that out. However, you have to be careful with the diatomaceous earth because if it does fall on the bees, it will damage that bee because on the microscopic scale, it is like throwing a bunch of razor blades in the colony. Uh, they are, they're very sharp and the beetles don't like them very much. Now over here we have um, what some people would call like Swiffer sheets. I don't find the Swiffer works quite as good for me. I use a product that's called Dynamax, D-I-N-E-A-M-A-X. It's made by Brani. And there's other products out there that are very similar. It's actually for polishing fine china. But what the bees do is they, they grab and they fluff up the fibers trying to get out of the hive because it's a foreign material, but they can't. But then the beetles have those legs that we were showing you earlier that have all kinds of like hinges and things to them that make them dig deep while they get tangled up in those fibers and voila. Now, if, if you were catching that many in them, your hive's in bad shape. That's, that's a whole lot in one towel. So typically you don't catch that many with them unless you're in a really bad situation. But those are a couple controls you can use right there. There's a, like I said, a few other things you can do incorporating chickens and things. Small hive beetles are really our biggest lesser pest. But again, like I said, one of the things that we're doing at um, our um, conference is we have a section where we want people to bring inventions. And so if you have some really fresh ideas on how to deal with um, small hive beetles or anything like that, you know, set it up, and if it actually works really good, we'll, we'll put it in a YouTube video. I think as beekeepers, we've got to um, really um, promote one another, and we've also got to invent for ourselves, because there's, there's not a lot of dollars that goes into beekeeping compared to a lot of other industries. You know, you look at the cattle industry and the beef industry, there's just you know, millions upon millions of dollars being poured into research and stuff, and there is some stuff being done into beekeeping, but when it comes to new product development, I think that's really on the beekeepers to do so. And, and usually the best ideas almost always come from beekeepers. So keep that in mind. Um, there's definitely a need for more products regarding small hive beetles. All right, so let's talk about wax moss a little bit. I really don't like these guys, but they're much easier than the small hive beetles. They've been around for a long time. When they first came to the U.S., their bees actually um, 
were roughed up pretty good by the wax moss because they just genetically weren't used to them being around. And now that our bees, they experience wax moss all throughout the season. You know, we don't see them a whole lot, but every night your, your colony is probably, that it's warm enough, your colony has wax moss trying to go into it. And the bees are very, as long as they're healthy, they're very good at re repelling wax moss. Now, these combs right here, I can promise you, if it, it's this bad, there's no salvaging any of those combs right there. It's all eat up. And this is a picture that I got off of one of my YouTube videos. I usually don't make my presentations quite so flashy. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's the only one I could find. <laughs> so over here, I wanted to also do a comparison with a small hive beetle. So this is a small hive beetle larvae compared to a greater wax moth larvae. And you have two types of wax moth larvae. You have the greater one up here, and then you have the lesser wax moth larvae. And one of the biggest distinctions you can see that these two have that this one doesn't is they have pretty good sized reddish brown looking heads. But yeah, that's the difference right there. But honestly, these little small high beetle larvae are much more damaging typically in my experience. The only time I have wax moth problems is when I've really neglected something. With the small hive beetles, sometimes it's just I don't get to the yard fast enough, so it's still kind of my fault. But sometimes weird things happen, or maybe the colonies swarm out a little bit too much and they don't leave enough bees behind, and I'm behind on my schedule, and the small hive beetles start sliming a certain area of the colony and just cause the rest of the bees to abscond, which will happen if small hive beetles get going in there good. The bees will just leave the hive. So over here we have the cocoons of the wax moth larvae, and they will, you can start seeing a little bit of a boring action right here. They will bore into that equipment, and uh, of course you can, hey, these are wonderful to fish with, FYI. That's really the only thing they're good for that I know of. Um, really good at catching blue gill and crappie, mm -mm. Um, But uh, that's, that's really the only use I have for them. Uh, chickens do love these too, but they don't go into the ground. They actually, you know, they'll go through their whole cycle right here inside the hive if they can. And storing, we'll get into storing your equipment here in a little bit, but you can see the damage right here, all the webbing and just completely eaten up. They definitely just, once they get going really good, and this didn't get caused by a couple. This, this got caused by you know, probably a hundred or so going through that thing. Quite a few wax moth larvae. All right, so what are products for comb protection? One of the things with the small hive beetles, we don't really have to worry about them getting into our storage super so much. But we do have to worry about wax moths a little bit. And up top we have a greater wax moth. And then below we have a lesser wax moth. So there's a little bit of difference there. Now we have a couple products right here. We have the Paramoth insecticide, which is kind of similar to mothballs, except it's better. Um, don't be using mothballs in your colony um, or in your stored supers, I should say. Um, some people like to use this. I've used it once for a video. And I haven't used this product yet. It actually was just released again for US um, use recently. It's called Certain or Certan, I'm not sure exactly. But whatever it is, I'm certain that it may or may not work for you. Um, this, this has made in the USA, so I mean, there, there's something good right there, at least. That, that, that goes a long ways at least in my book. But what this is, is a BT. It's a, a bacteria, bacillus, something, another fancy word. And then you can spray it in your combs. And I don't, I've never used it, but some beekeepers are using this in their stored super, spraying that in there. And if a wax moth does get in there and lay offspring, the bacteria will attack the eggs. And I believe it'll attack the larvae, but I'm not 100% sure. But this right here actually is like kind of more of a fumigant. You have to close up the, the supers. And definitely follow the instructions if you use one of these things because I'm not an expert. I'll tell you how I store my combs here in just a second. I am certain of how that works. And <laughs> I'm wearing out the certain joke on her. <laughs> She's over here just like, you know, what do you do? But th this product right here, you've got to close the hives up and keep that um, gas or whatever it is into the supers and, and it, it, it did good for me but in my video I actually had a stack of boxes treated with a paramount and then I had a stack of supers that was untreated with neither of these products and both stacks came out of winter just fine but I'll tell you why that was. 
All right, so storage. This is something we really don't want to see in our storage. What do wax moths and what do small hybrids want? They want nutrition, just like everything else. And right there, all that bee bread in those combs is full of fats and proteins and minerals and all kinds of stuff. That's really what they want. They'll want that or they'll want brood because brood is very nutritious too. But when we're storing our supers, we don't want any of that stuff. Now, if we just had empty cells like this, by and large, they'll leave it alone to a degree. There's some variables there, and we'll get into that in one second. This hardware cloth piece right here is something we use because mice, mice are also a lesser pest. I'm really not going to talk about them too much, just the fact that you need to have something to keep mice from getting in because they'll love to sleep in your boxes and your frames all winter long and urinate all over your combs and mm, mm, can't wait to extract honey out of those next year. And so mice can be a really big problem. They'll chew up the wood, the wax, all kinds of stuff. So the hardware cloth is really handy for them. And what we'll do with our boxes when we store them is we will stack them, you know, about yay high. So you can go taller than that, but I really don't do that. Yeah, for, just because Laurel doesn't want to, that's why. And so why that is, is um, I'm short. So I'll just say it. I'm short. So any, but what we're trying to do is create an environment that has airflow. We'll have one of these screens at the bottom, and then we can have one at the top as well. Wax moths do not like daylight, and they also don't like a lot of ventilation. We're not leaving them out in the sun, but I'll have them in a shed that is not completely closed off. You know, it's open-ended, doesn't have a door all the way around it or something, so you can get some daylight into there. And as long as there's not a lot of resources in there, I've had very, very good success for many years not using any products in there. But what we like to do, again, is have about six deep boxes stacked on each other. We'll have a hardware cloth underneath and on top to ensure that mice don't get in there primarily. Wax moths can still get through this stuff if they want to, especially the, the lesser ones. And occasionally, we'll, and we'll see this, when we pull the supers, we'll see a couple tunnels going through there occasionally. But if you get one or two tunnels through a comb, it's not a big deal. Your bees will be able to fix that. It's really when you get dozens and dozens or hundreds where you get the really bad damage. And we, we definitely make sure that we don't store them that have a lot of bee bread and stores in them. If you're going to store combs like that, it's best to have them in a strong, healthy colony or in the freezer or something like that. Or you can use the Paramount product and, or possibly the certain product. I don't know if it's recommended for combs that have resources in them or not. But that's basically all we do to ours is we, we stack them up. Now, we don't really want 10 frames in there. So we'll have nine frames or eight frames in each box. And again, that's for ventilation and light to get through there. There's no resources in there. So wax moss and small hive beetles cannot raise good, healthy offspring off of just wax. There's not that much nutrition in there. But if you are concerned about trying that, then what you could do, and what I did when I was testing this out, is I used some of the product, and then you can use a, maybe a couple of your supers with no product and kind of use the method I talked about and see how it works for you. And I find that it works extremely well for us with very, very little damage at all. We have several types of pests right here. Over on this side, we have the European hornet. We have the queen up top. We have... I thought you said something wrong. I'm so used to Laurel correcting me in my videos. Well, she's like, cut, cut, cut. How many times have we been through this? And she, you know, after a while, she gets a little tired. She's like, take 42. And uh, seriously, I've actually had one or two videos go that far. And it's like midnight, and we're both so tired. But, but I thought she was correcting me. I'm just so used to being corrected by her. It's, just, it's automatic these days. Um, so I've got this queen up here, we got the worker European hornet down here, and then we have the drone. You see how just sad and lonely he looks down there? Drones really have it rough. I'm so thankful that I am not a drone. But Laurel still reminds me of how that system works. <laughs> so we've had these for a long time, and people constantly on Facebook and other groups are saying, man, I've got Japanese hornets, I've got murder hornets, or whatever you want to call them. The, the, uh, the media just loves blowing things out of proportion. And uh, that's really all they're good at. Uh, I won't get into that anymore. But we see these in Tennessee, and they can become a problem, especially if there's a nest close by. 
and they will pick off bees constantly, especially late in the season, and just go after one bee after the other. Healthy bees are very nutritious, and so is basically everything in the colony. Bees are really a, a good resource for birds and insects, but being beekeepers, one of our jobs is um, kind of coexisting with them and being good stewards of them and a guardian, so to speak. Of course, we have yellow jackets here. They look, a lot of people that don't know anything about bees think that they're honeybees, and um, they're nothing like them. It's, it's awful. Uh, they, they come to the hives, do similar things, not quite as much damage as these do, but you know, if they can grow to huge populations. I've only had one year in 18 that I've actually thought the, the yellow jackets were contributing to some losses. And there was a huge nest close by. And I believe in using natural controls, and I naturally used a lot of gasoline on that. Um, <laughs> yellow jacket nest right there. Now, there are some more natural ways. Let me tell you, um, the EPA would just love to know half the things we do in Gainesboro, Tennessee. Um, in all seriousness, though, we, we do try to actually be a little bit more protective of the environment than that. But there are many ways that um, you can take care of these pests. Primarily is if you can locate the nest and eradicate it. That's the best way to deal with it. That's not always possible. And some people would rather not do that. But um, yeah, that's one of the things that we will do, if I, especially if I, you know, with our kids play in the yard around our beehives and stuff. My bees are pretty chill most days. Um, but these things just get all over everything. Kids will be eating an apple and yellow jack will be on it. So they, they just chip away. These things aren't huge pests. Big, strong colonies are the main thing. Now, the, these hornets over here, the Japanese hornets, are definitely um, quite a bit different than these two right here. Where they'll actually go into the colony and are very tenacious. However, it's not as bad as social media makes it out to be. Can you believe that? The social media got it wrong and the news didn't get it right. I can't believe that. <laughs> But seriously, they, they are a bit of a problem because they'll come in squads and go into the colony and go after the brood. And they're, they're big and they're bad and they know that they're tough. And our bees, if they do make it out this way, right now they're all in the northwest and they're trying to do their best to keep them under control. But probably like most everything else, we'll wind up getting it. But it's not as bleak as what the news will tell you. There are things that we can use. And beekeepers are very resilient because otherwise there's, there's no other option. You're either resilient or you're out, you're out of beekeeping. That's basically the two options. And these hornets right here can be controlled, not just with this Apame hive, but this is just an example. You see these entrances right here, and you can get metal ones, there's plastic ones. If the Japanese hornets did make it over here, you can use entrances that make it to where the hornets actually can't get inside the hive. That doesn't mean they won't cause damage. It's like the yellow jacket and the European hornet. What they do is they'll sit outside from the hive just a little ways and they will just pick off bees one by one. But that's something that the bees are kind of, they deal with. There's other things like birds and dragonflies and other things that robber flies and spiders, all kinds of stuff. Their bees are highly sought after again because they're very nutritious and if they're a good, healthy colony, it's an abundant source of resources for all these predators. But you can use entrance reducers to still allow your bees to fly through them pretty easily, but will allow those Japanese hornets not to be able to get into the colony and wreak so much havoc. So you know there is a lot of hope and, and things for the future. The murder hornets aren't going to wipe out all the bees like they're saying. So that's just one style right there. Going back just a hair, again, there's a couple controls that we have, by and large, is finding the nests. The other thing is you can put out some traps. If you use something that's really sweet, your bees will be attracted to it as well. And so you have to make sure it's something the bees can't get in if you're going to use something sweet. And that won't really work for these two because they're so much bigger than a bee. It can work for yellow jackets because they're a little bit smaller, but the trap has to be really kind of specialized. I prefer and have tested out some that uses meat because they're really after that fat and protein, so if you can put out some smelly meat, there's traps that you can purchase, and there's other things that are online. Just be careful with what's online, because a lot of these people on YouTube, and man, they're just, they're just crazy people. And, you know, Bob knows what I'm talking about, don't you, Bob? Yeah, those crazy YouTubers, I'm telling you. So that's basically all I can think of for those guys, is primarily hunting down the nest. You can get some traps out for them and reduce the entrances. 
But one thing that we deal with in Tennessee is a lot of heat, and I've seen some of these traps that are new for the small hive beetles and for these pests, and some of them are literally putting entrances that are completely blocked off except a couple pipes coming out of it, and they're doing that so it's hard for these pests to be able to get into the colony, and supposedly small hive beetles can't hover, and so they have to be able to just fly straight in kind of like an airplane would, so it's very hard for them to come through that pipe. The problem is your bees also in summer really need to be able to ventilate the colony and cool the colony down. And the bees will actually abscond from a colony if it gets too hot and they can't maintain the temperature. Leave brood and everything. Just, and then that's where you see that picture where there's small high beetle larvae all over the place. So when, if you're going to use an entrance reducer to protect your bees, make sure they have other sources of ventilation. It could be screened off with that hardware cloth I showed you. A lot of beekeepers will use that. They'll use number eight, which is like an eighth inch of a square. And that way you can still keep some things out, but also get some ventilation. Ventilation is very important to the colonies. And one thing that we do on the little colonies to help with um, summer heat is we'll take an extra lid or something you can put on top. Just give them a little bit more deep shade. One thing I failed to mention with the small hive beetles is there is a natural tendency to have higher beetle levels in colonies that are in um, a lot of shade. So many beekeepers keep their bees in full sun for that reason. I have bees in full sun, I have bees that are half and half, and I have some that are almost in complete shade. And I would say there is a difference between the ones that are infested, um, that are the ones that are in the shade definitely have more beetles. But if they're really strong and healthy, they still do pretty well. There's really a, not a crazy ton of silver bullet options. I think that's kind of the story that you're going to see with um, varroa mites as well. It really comes down to consistent management throughout the season. When it comes to small high beetles, what I like to do is if I'm going to use traps or anything to catch them, I, I try to get them at, at the weak part of the season. They're really weak coming out of winter because a lot of them die off during winter. And especially if you have a cold winter, the ones that are in the ground will dry off. So if you can get some traps in to get the ones that survive with your bees coming out of winter and already chip away at those percentages before they have a time to reproduce, that can really help your overall season with small hive beetles. And that really goes the same way with these guys here. If you see a bunch of them starting to hover around early in the season, you can track down that nest or you can um, put out some traps and chip away at them while they're small because they, these colonies don't overwinter in big clusters. Uh, they really don't actually overwinter a bunch of worker bees at all. And so they have to start over from, from scratch every year, which is like a queen. And so now I think maybe in the deep south it's a little bit different, but in areas that get a serious winter, I believe they have to start over from scratch. Do you know about that, Bob? Uh, they do overwinter very small. Yeah, overwinter very small. So you heard it right, Bob Benny said it. All right. <laughs> so if anyone has any arguments, take it up with Bob over there, not me. <laughs> Sorry, Bob. I'm just messing with you. you have to throw under the bus <laughs> well, see, for me, they try throwing me under the bus, but I fit right between the tires. <laughs> <laughs> you're my wife. You're not supposed to laugh so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, they, they have to start over from scratch at the beginning of the year. So again, really. Management, management, management. When I look at operations like Bob's, has, we've changed from going to someone 18 years ago that knew nothing about bees to knowing a little bit of something about bees. It is what's really changed and helped us be successful and stay ahead of these things is the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I remember my dad saying that four million times as a teenager, and doggone it, he was right again. Um, I, he, he was right about a lot of things, even though my dad's never gotten into a hive of bees with me. Um, he actually did support me getting into bees, though, so that was something. He's like, well, if that's what you want to do, just make sure that you, you know, put forth the right amount of effort and don't screw it up some. And, uh, well, and I did for several years. I didn't know what I was doing, and that's kind of why Bob and I do videos, and we are encouraging a lot of people to network, because this is how we learn. This is how we bring regeneration into the industry of of beekeeping, young people learning at a, at a younger age than we did, and and just everyone collaborating because there are so many things that I've learned over the last couple of years that has really helped me out to manage things better, and I learned it from people, you know, going to clubs like this and from guys like Bob who put up with me and 
the different things like that. So I'm really excited to be here. I've had a blast so far, and we're just getting started. But let's take some questions. Anyone have any questions on any of the things that I talked about? Or was I just that thorough? Okay, go ahead. Did you ever uh, try to use cedar or anything else to discourage um, wax moths? You know, I've never tried that as far as in supers. I definitely think it would take a, a pretty good concentration, but I'm not saying that it's impossible, though. Cedar has repelled some things, but as far as research and my knowledge of what work or what it not, I don't know. And again, I don't use anything for my supers, and as long as I kind of follow the principles of having dry cones and good ventilation and some uh, a little bit of light coming through, that seems to work really good. But something like maybe a natural cedar oil that's you know, derived from natural cedar could be off putting, but could that over time cause some issues with buildup in wax? I mean, who knows? You know, I, I did a video one time on, uh, I'm kind of getting to a point here. People were asking and wanted me to do a video on multiple types of fuels for smokers. And so I laid out several things that were good at making smoke. And I mentioned tobacco, and man, everybody jumped on me with two feet. Oh, you're going to kill people, cancer, all that stuff. Well, I'm not saying that you should, I'm just saying that works really good. Personally, I think a little bit like that probably doesn't hurt anything, and we have a lot of research on tobacco. I use pine needles all the time. That stuff could be five times worse for all we know. Nobody knows. So that's kind of where, um, as beekeepers, again, we're, we're kind of, there's a lot of things like that cedar oil that possibly could work really good, but we have no idea. So, you know, I think that there's a possibility. I would love to see someone do a little bit of research on more natural essential oil stuff like that. But then again, most of the stuff you see on essential oils is on YouTube and it's terrible. Well, uh, by the way, I've never done an essential oil video, just so you know. Um, I did do the one where we actually blew that hive up, but that wasn't real essential oil, that was a minute. What do you got, Bob? I've never heard anyone approaching murder hornets like that, but I do know some people that use that for other pests. Um, yeah, mice and stuff. Um, but I don't know if they've ever had Tennessee mice. Everything's so rough in Tennessee, our mice are so skinny, I don't know. Um, but, but, but you're right, I mean, you could use some very inexpensive quarter-inch hardware cloth, and that would work really good for Japanese hornets. Because those things are huge. That picture really doesn't do it justice. You can see how big these things are, and these are significantly larger than those are. Um, and so it would take a, a good size inches for them to be able to get inside, but a quarter inch hardware cloth, and for those of you who don't know where you can get that, if you've got a good hardware store, probably get it at the Home Depot or Lowe's, they just won't know what you're talking about probably. Um, but we've got a good hardware store in Gainesboro, and those people have been hardware storing for three generations, and I've talked to them about stuff, and they can actually get me what I need. And I use hardware cloth quite a bit, it's really a, Andy, got any more questions out there on this stuff? Go ahead. Hey, David, have you tried uh, crushed lime rock underneath your hives for um, small hive fields? That's a, that's a good point. Um, good question. I have not tried that. Now, I have used stuff in trays underneath the hives, like diatomaceous earth. And some people are using crushed lime and different things. And the goal is to have something that's going to win the larvae. If you do have an infestation, or just you know, a few of them maybe get in the patty and they get chucked out and hit the ground, they need to hit something that's going to dry them out and cut them up, something like that. And so some people, what they will do is around their colonies, they will build a kind of like a little bit of a raised um, bit of wood, and they'll fill that up full of lime, or they'll fill that full up with diatomaceous earth, or different things that's going to cut them up, make it hard for them to be able to survive in that environment and kill them. I've never tried that. I think if you had something underneath your hive like that, that's definitely going to, um, if anything drops out and it actually works, that would be awesome. Uh, so it's a little bit trickier when you have hundreds of hives to be able to do that. Um, but definitely on the smaller scale, that's again where sometimes the smaller beekeepers have more advantages than the professionals that they're able to dial things in a little bit more, and I think that there's definitely some room for that. There's also some products out there, um, I think by Guardstar and a couple others, and they're called Milky Spore, and it's nematodes, and you can spray it in the ground. But the problem is, again, is this stuff, it's hard to tell how effective it really is. 
and some of it can be pretty expensive. But then again, um, I think putting something under the hive, like what he mentioned with the limestone or maybe even sand, I don't know. It's just something that'll cut them up and it stays really dry. A lot depends on climate. That's why in certain parts of California that's very dry, in places that have hard soils and are very dry, they don't like it very much. They also don't like places that are really cold. That's why they love Tennessee so much. Because we get lots of rain, we have easy soil to, to dig down into just a little bit. Because they really don't go that far down into the soil. Most of the time they're just about eight deep into it. Just about maybe a centimeter at most. And so, you know, that's why the chickens can be so helpful. But it just really depends a lot on your soil type, how prevalent they are. But in places like in Florida and Louisiana and Hawaii, it's just a constant, constant battle with them year round. Another question. Go ahead. Your insights on ants and skunks? Oh, you know, that would be good if we got around to that one. <laughs> I was just hoping you guys would figure that one out. Um, no, seriously, that is a good Good topic because uh, ants really can be a little um, a, a bother them, more of a headache. Now, in some places we have different types of ants. In the south, they can be a a big problem. The type of ants we had in Tennessee are just more of a nuisance. And once we went away from using inner covers, we actually got away from ants pretty much altogether. Bees that are strong and healthy and that can patrol the inside of the hive and everything, they're good with the ants that we have. Um, I've never noticed ants chipping away the percentages of my bees. The worst thing that they'll do is get in my feeders or something like that if I have a, a top feeder on a hive or something like that. There's a crack they can get up into. The one hive I do have, and I've used it in my videos, it's the horizontal hive that has like 30-something deep frames in it, which has been really good. I've enjoyed it very much. It does have inner covers, and I get ants in that thing all throughout the season. It doesn't bother the bees, but then I'll open the lid and they'll crawl up my hands and stuff and then start biting me like there's actually thinking they're going to do some major damage, but they are just a, a pest by and large. Now, in some places, ants can be a big problem, but in my location, basically, it's just allowing the colonies to stay healthy and allowing them to have access to everything. And so using a migratory lid with no inner cover, the bees are able to completely patrol the bottom of that lid, and I don't have any ant problems. Now, some people use cinnamon if you are using an inner cover or multiple other things. I've tried a couple products and with not really great success, so I really can't speak much on that. Some people get moats underneath their hives and put oil and all kinds of things, and honestly, I really think keeping the colony strong and not allowing the ants to have any free access is really important. The same way with the beetles, just allow the colony. As beekeepers, our first goal is to keep our colony strong and healthy. If we do that, most of these problems don't ever come up. But, you know, allowing them to patrol the area helps so, so much. Now, the skunks are definitely a lesser pest, but they're very annoying. If you keep your colonies low to the ground here in Tennessee, uh, where you have lots of skunks, I imagine they have a lot up here. I know when we were in Indiana, we had skunks all over the place. And um, not just in the politics, but also out in the fields. <laughs> and so the, the skunks will scratch the entrance of the hive, and apparently they're good at taking stings, and they will just... Um, cause the guard bees to come out and they'll just eat them up. And the main thing that happens is if they do that going into winter, that can lower your winter bee population. We want that cluster to be as big as possible. But the main reason I don't like skunks is if they're getting fed on consistently and you come back to those yards, those bees can be hot, hot, hot. And they'll take out all that abuse they've been getting from the skunk on you. <laughs> and they'll let you know how much they appreciate that stand being so low to the ground. There's a, there's a couple things that you can do for skunks, but half the time, if you do them just slightly wrong, it backfires on you, and I mean that in the literal and figurative sense. <laughs> you can catch them in traps, you can um, shoot them with a 22. there's a lot of different things. My dad um, <clears throat> was having a skunk issue one time, and it was really causing some issues. And um, I won't go into the whole story, because it'd be, it'd be a while, but he wanted it gone. Of course, being his go-getter son, and the eldest, the inheritor, and all that stuff, I took it upon myself to shoot it 20 feet from the house. <laughs> Haven't lived that one down either, so we were having a party the next day. <laughs> we didn't taste the food very much, so I should put it that way. My poor mother, she's always been more sensitive to smells, and oh, the skunk was going really good throughout the house. But 
So I mean, there's, there's skunks um, are kind of a lesser pest too, but that's really all I have on ants and skunks. I'm sure there's better information out there. I was told to talk about general lesser pests, and this is what I come up with. If you have, Laurel definitely has more information though, so be sure to ask her after it's over. <laughs> if you don't see me tomorrow, uh, or if I'm in a cast or something, <laughs> yeah. All right, go ahead in the back. Okay, so we're going to jump over to mites, which is all, all good. That'll actually be one of my topics later on, and is an important subject. So that colony had 94 mites and an alcohol wash of 300 bees. So when we talk about infested, we're like, the 11th hour was a long time ago. It was really bad. We actually did a lot of that colony to survive. Oh, I've only got like one minute left. We're going to have to make this one quick in the last question. So... We did save that colony. We would cleaned it two times. The queen was loaded with viruses. Um, I, queens that are infected can lay eggs that will have viruses in the offspring. And we actually eradicated the mites over time. Basically what we did when we did that wash, we did not treat the, the hive. It was one I caught and I thought they were kind of like wildish looking bees. So we thought, let's just see how it plays out. The first year I caught them in the spring, they built up, looked wonderful, went to winter wonderful came out of the next year, and they, they weren't really super strong. They made a small honey crop, and I believe that's because of the, of the mites. And then towards that summer where I did the videos, you could just see the foreign wing virus, sac root virus, several things in the colony, and they just, they could not build. The queen was laying a bunch of eggs, but it never t turned into extra bees because everything was just so riddled with mites. And of course, we did that wash. And so almost one out of every three bees had a mite on it. That's how bad the infestation was. Now a mite, for those of you who don't know, is about the size of my head compared to a bee's body. Thereabouts. So, you know, quite big. Um, Arl's just... Okay. All right. That one climbed on me. So, they're a big problem. And the viruses that they vector are, are even worse than the mites are. So what we did is we wanted to show folks that five rounds of oxalic acid vapor does not indeed give you a 90% kill. That's been going around for a long time and it's not really anybody's fault per se. When we got oxalic acid in this country, we really didn't know what it did. And some people like once a week for three weeks and you're good and that's 90% kill. Some people like five times in 21 days. Some people would do it once a month, every month. Well, the problem is none of those really work that good in my opinion unless the mites are already very low. So we did five rounds in 21 days on that colony, and we actually upped the dosage a little bit on the oxalic acid, which is now the legal dosage, so um, you can use a little bit more. But we were heavy-handed, and it knocked them back down to like 94, 95, 96, something. No, did I say 90? 36, sorry. So they went from 94 to like 36, with five rounds in 21 days. So that gave us some knockback that was an incredible knockback. And then we used two apivar strips after we were done with the oxalic acid, and we requeened the colony during this period. Now after we did that, it dropped them down a good ways, but at this point the colony is broodless because they're so riddled basically with viruses. We're talking like four frames worth of bees now because they just keep shrinking and shrinking, which just happens in the fall a lot to our bees. And then they actually survived winter, which blew me away. They survived winter with about two frames worth of bees, but they had a new queen that I had introduced, and we had eliminated all the mites, but even coming out of winter, we were still seeing some signs of viruses. And they just could not get going like the rest of the colonies. They were little. I gave them a frame of brood from another colony, which helped get them a little bit of ground speed. I think that was sometime in March that I gave them that frame of brood. And then when the nectar flow hit, it seemed like all of a sudden the viruses were cleaned up and they were able to take off again. But they didn't make any honey production that year or even a much decent splitting off of them. I think we did get one nuke off of it later that year. But so we put all of that work, all of that treatment, and that queen through all of that, um, we didn't get anything out of it. And it's not all, all of a sudden we've got to make money off of every colony. That's not the case. But we want our bees to be healthy. And healthy bees are actually bees that in ideal conditions are going to make surplus honey. That's what they want to do. 
So it's kind of a by helping our bees out, you know, they make profit and we can make profit too. And it's not all about the money, but I do want my bees to be healthy, and the healthiest bees typically are the ones that produce the most. So, you know, that is a case that I I use for an example of what not to do. So don't be letting your mites get up to that high wheel of a load. We'll be talking more about that in my later talk. But yeah, that's a, that was a, a very fortunate case. If I was taking a bet, I would have bet a thousand dollars that that colony would not survive that winter. I was really surprised. More often than not, those bees would be a loss. Don't let it, don't let it happen. I guess it's all the time we have for these lesser pests and everything, but thanks everyone for coming in and listening to all this jibber-jabber, and I hope you've learned a little bit about what not to do.